He's been a CPA for more than 25 years, and his expert advice has been featured in a number of newspapers and journals, including the Long Island Business News. Today, we're speaking with Desmond Ryan, who's the executive director of the Association for a Better Long Island, to talk to him about Hurricane Sandy and its effects on our community. In light of how much damage Hurricane Sandy has caused our area, we wanted to address your questions about losses to your business. So we've brought in CPA Tim McHale. So Maria, today we want to talk about Latinos on Long Island. Mm -hmm. Now for some people who aren't aware, give us a sense of where we are now in terms of numbers of Latinos on the island as opposed to maybe five or 10 years ago. He's been practicing for more than 25 years and provides training and education to the staff. So he's up on the latest tax codes and regulations. Paulino says he's already had to throw out at least three pallets of produce, 3,500 pounds of meat, and 200 pounds of ham and cheese. Now, final question. Is there such a thing as good debt versus bad debt? For example, if you're trying to expand your business, it's okay, you shouldn't feel bad about trying to get loans? Um, we wanna know how to make money as kids. Gabby and Hannah, we love that you're already thinking like entrepreneurs. Henry Montag of Financial Forms says you have a lot of options these days. She'd set up a table, put out the items with price tags, and my mom would make the rest of us buy something from her instant customers. So whatever you decide to do, good luck girls. The National Retail Federation projects that holiday sales will increase by 4.1 percent this holiday shopping season. And when we return right after the break, we'll be answering your questions in Money and Main Streets, Heard on the Street. Stay with us. You're watching Money and Main Street. I'm Giovanna Dierpik. Central Islip resident Teresa Sexton has faced the challenging economy with optimism. Hurricane Sandy has added to her list of worries, but she's looking for things to get better in the future. Here's today's Eye on the Island. In just two weeks, lives and fortunes can change, for better and worse. Just ask Teresa and Vernon Sexton. When we first met them, their priorities were finding a better job for Teresa, more work for Vernon, and getting health insurance coverage for their very ill newborn granddaughter, Lila. You know, and they wonder why a lot of people in the world are without health insurance coverage because nobody can afford it. She says she and Vernon would have had to pay $1,600 a month for little Lila to be covered. You see, Lila was born with serious heart issues. And even though Teresa has a job, she's making $2 an hour less than before the Great Recession. She'd been trying to find a job in medical billing after being unemployed for three years. I've called companies and told them that I'll be willing to work for free for, you know, uh, um, two, three weeks to show them that I am determined and that I could do it if, if they gave me a chance. What I do is I do construction real work and, and the economy has not allowed the uh, towns or the cities to build new roads or bridges. In Teresa's case, she took out $16,000 in student loans with the promise she'd come out with a better paying career in medical billing. She remembers hearing. When jobs see that, they will definitely hire you. That's what they told me. <laughs> they didn't care about this piece of paper. And then Hurricane Sandy hit. Teresa and Vernon's focus shifted away from the job search. Well, put a hold on everything because in the midst of trying to keep warm and trying to make sure we had something to eat every day, not, you know, with the lights being out, trying to find gas for the generator. Vernon, the family's main breadwinner, couldn't work for two weeks. The city shut down the jobs. Still, despite her family's own problems, Teresa made the time to help others. I was helping my sister-in-law. She works um, at St. Anne's. Um, I was helping her feed the people that, that lost lights uh, like myself. Um, and that lost things that, you know, and did not have food. And that's how we found Teresa after the hurricane, surrounded by boxes of food, food she was preparing to deliver to the less fortunate. You see a lot of people that's really, really struggling. Teresa's job search had to be put on hold, but something special did happen. It happened just as baby Lila was ready to come home after not one, but two heart surgeries. So the lights had came on like an hour before she had got her home. And the little girl who spent her short life attached to tubes in the intensive care unit of the hospital is now resting comfortably in Teresa and Vernon's warm house. And just knowing that what she went through, you know, our things that we're going through is a small thing to what this baby had to go through the first few weeks of her life. We're 
always searching for the best business stories on Long Island. So if you know of one, tell us about it. We hope you're enjoying Money in Main Street. I'm Giovanna Derpik. Smithtown resident Lori Thomas is the director of the Miss Long Island pageant. A former pageant winner herself, Thomas is building the brand and the value of the pageant's name. She shares with us exactly what goes into running this type of business. Here's today's Eye on the Island. Just hours before showtime, the contestants of the Long Island and Miss Long Island teen pageants get down and get pumped. The actual pageant lasts only a couple of hours, but the executive director and organizer, Lori Thomas, says the business end of it takes much longer to plan and execute. I would compare it most to a wedding where people are engaged for a year and they have all the planning and they have to do this and the photographer and the flowers and the and takes all year and you want the one day to go perfectly. And the house lights are going to go up. A former Mrs. Long Island herself, Thomas says she launched the business five years ago. Her ownership of an advertising agency with her husband helped her figure out where to begin. So she started with the name. The Miss Long Island name is, is trademarked. I own it outright, independently. So I knew that once I was able to accomplish that, that I had something really of unique value. But it's not just the organizer of the pageant that's treating this like a business. Others are too. Well, I treat every day like it's a business. Uh, whether I'm an ice girl for the New York Islanders, I'm always promoting myself, just like this pageant, or even when I'm teaching skating. I'm always looking for a way to show people that I'm out there and the best I can be. The audience may see this as primarily a beauty-related event. Thomas calls the pageant a true community-centered event. It's a Long Island business event. It's run by businesses. It's supported by businesses. Brand awareness, always everybody's number one desire. To create brand awareness, the pageant partners with local companies like Park Jewelers. The businesses provide sponsorships, and the pageant provides them with marketing and sales opportunities. Another level of sponsorship, they'll be set up with a jewelry table in the lobby. They get tons of exposure. They get full page ads in the program book. They are linked on our website directly to them. Thomas says the pageant's core operating budget comes from the entry fee. To pay for it, some of the contestants turn to local businesses for help. Then they go to the local pizza place that they frequent all the time, the nail salon, the hair salon, their parents' job. And we have 30 girls in the pageant. That's 30 towns on Long Island that have businesses that are supporting their local resident to go and compete and do something like this. The entry fee helps Thomas pay for things like rental of the theater, hiring the production crew, insurance, catering, and outside editing. Ticket sales for the pageant also generate one half to three fourths of the pageant's total income. Thomas says the business is profitable, but not to the extent people might expect. I don't think anyone retired a millionaire owning a pageant. So as the girls make sure they capture memories of the big day, Thomas says her payoff comes from watching the young ladies serve the Long Island community. Breast cancer, drunk driving, anti-bullying, homelessness, to have hundreds of other girls and encouraging them to give back to Long Island and help people on Long Island in so many different causes and a myriad of different activities. That's like me doing community service a hundredfold. This seven foot tall replica of the Statue of Liberty stands in a place you might not expect. It's in the front yard of Diane Huggins, who lives on Main Street in the small Pennsylvania town of Burgettstown. She's a woman who calls herself just a mom, regular mother. But this regular mother has done something quite remarkable. Despite not knowing a single victim or having any personal connection to the September 11th attacks, Diane made it her personal mission to write a poem about each of the nearly 3,000 victims. So now how many poems have you written? 1,697. Diane was already raising three special needs children she adopted when a woman in the Netherlands contacted her. The woman was creating a website for 9-11 victim Greg Sikorsky at the request of his brother. She came across poems that Diane had written and posted on her personal website. The woman asked her to write a poem about Greg. You lost your life so suddenly when duty called to you, but we know you didn't die in vain. It was a job you loved to do. Soon after, more requests followed and Diane made the decision to write a poem 
for every victim. It started out as healing, and, and then it was um, determination to remember each one as I read more and more about them and learned about them. Diane has written five or six poems in one day. Other times, it's taken her days or even months to finish just one. She researches each victim. She gets pictures. Family members are often surprised to learn that Diane takes the time to find out unique details about each victim's life, which she includes in her poems. You were known as the man in the red bandana. You never wavered or strayed. Diane saves the thank you notes, the photos, and all of the mementos that have been sent to her. They're a part of her home and her heart. And, and that deeply touched me when I got that. I cried. It, it just, I cherish it. One of the victim's family members even gave Diane this flag, which flew at ground zero. Diane made a promise to that man that every 9-11 anniversary, she would fly that flag, barring rain. Ten years later, she's kept that promise. Diane's daughter Kayla says her mom's poetry project has changed how she relates to the victims of 9-11. A lot of people lost their lives and you didn't really know any of them. It's like you know all those people and you sort of feel their pain through the poems that she, she writes. Diane says she feels a connection with each person she's written about. She hopes her poems will help Americans reconnect with each other. And I wish that our entire country would go back to those days after 9-11, where all our flags were out and everyone was kind and loving, because I think that's what we really need. It's no wonder that this mom who's writing poems about strangers. For the lives you tried to save that day, you're a hero through and through is the same woman who didn't think twice about putting her patriotism on display.